Amos. Uh, these are people who spoke against the nation. They had the unpleasant task of representing God in the presence of a very wicked nation. You say, well, what's the point of this today? I'm going to suggest that much of what we do in contemporary Western countries, Britain, America, it's not a nationalist thing, but in any of our modern countries, we are guilty of the same problems as the prophets indicted contemporary Israel in the 8th century BC. So, we could talk history a lot, and, and the commentaries are full of the historical sense, but what about today? How does this impact us today in the 2017s in America? Well, chapter 7 of Hosea goes like this. Let me read 1 and ask uh, Sarah to read 2. 7 1. When I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered, and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits raid outside. And they do not consider in their hearts that I remember all their wickedness. Now their deeds are all around them, they are before my face. Their evil makes their king happy, their false gods please their leaders. Mm -hmm. They are all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker, who ceases to stir up the fire from the kneading of the dough until it is done. Yes, that's fine. On royal holidays, the princes get drunk. Mm -hmm. The king makes a fool of himself and drinks with those who are making fun of him. For their hearts are like an oven, as they approach their plotting, their anger smolders all night. In the morning, it burns like a flaming fire. All and then verse seven. All of them are hot like an oven, and they consume their rulers. All their kings have fallen. None of them calls on me. Now that's a very, very severe indictment, of course. And I'm not suggesting that every ruler in America is a drunk. It's not. It's not the point. But I do think that a lot of what we do on television is simply plays in, into the hands of illicit sex. If it isn't money, it's sex. Terribly overplayed. In the kingdom, a lot of what is done on television, and I'm talking about Fox News and CNN both, uh, would have to be challenged, the dress styles often, and the content of what they do. And movies, already movies, sex and violence, that will stop in the kingdom. You cannot encourage that in the field of entertainment while claiming to be obeying these uh, laws of God and laws of Jesus. So that would have to change. Now, what really intrigues me here is that you talk about the kings and princes. That's to say the ruler and his courtiers. Well, do you realize the whole Bible is about who's going to be king and who are going to be the courtiers? The solution to this is to change the leadership, right? And the leaders will teach the rest of them. So the New Testament is full of material that I never heard in church that the Christians are the kings in training. In other words, God had his eye, has his eye on a government and a system, a television system, a, an, enta an entertainment system, a whole culture, we would say today, that is going to be godly. And it isn't that way today. So wherever it applies to you, you apply it to yourself. If you're involved in any of these things, R-rated movies, hardly suitable, I would think, sex and violence, some television programs, endless preoccupation with fiction and imaginative stuff. It may be a nice escape from narrative life, but a limited amount of that. Uh, my wife was telling me that at the book club, <laughs> at the library, which she used to go to sometimes, she said, I can't go anymore because the books they're choosing are so awful. Well, there you go. She can't even stand the quality of the books. So you make that application. Maybe people are making it for us. We'll see if Carlos has anything there to report from comments. Anybody saying anything about this first seven verses? Uh, no, people are still going on about mm -hmm. earlier comments. <laughs> yes. But uh, I do like to thank Corey because yeah. uh, he did uh, point to the, and, and, G, and Jesus did explicitly yeah. cite Moses in John 5. Yes. He said, there is one who will accuse you, that mm. is Moses, in whom you claim to have placed your hope. This is yes. John 5, 46. If indeed you believed Moses, ah. you would believe me because he wrote yes. about me. Yes. Well, so that, that, that takes care of the uh, questions regarding who wrote. Of course. <laughs> well, it's self-evident. Jesus is working out the Bible. 
You either believe Moses and what Moses said about Jesus, and of course you have to believe in addition that new covenant element, which is new and goes beyond Moses. Moses said in Matthew 19, but I'm saying something else. Moses said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I'm saying something else. So Jesus is the end and the final part of the final Moses. Jesus, in fact, in Matthew, his teachings are divided into five blocks. Notice five blocks. What does that remind you of? The five blocks of Genesis, Exodus, and so on. The five books of Moses, five early books. Jesus comes along as the new Moses, and Matthew's arranged it very cleverly in five blocks. So five times in Matthew, Jesus said, or Matthew reporting him, says, when Jesus had finished all these things, like a chorus, when Jesus had finished all these things, five times over, he's copying the fivefold division of the law to tell us that Jesus is the new and the final Moses. That's most important. So, and emphasize the yeah. fact that Jesus did away with the divorce certificate. Absolutely, he did. Tore that apart. Absolutely. That was given by Moses. It was given by Moses, and he said, God allowed you to divorce your husbands or wives for rather frivolous reasons even, because of the hardness of your heart. That's what Jesus said. But I'm telling you, read the book of Genesis, marriage is for life. Divorce is a disaster. I hate divorce, it says. Not the unforgivable sin. There is a valid reason for being divorced, according to Matthew 19, if the sexual bond is broken permanently. And then in Paul, Jesus speaking in Paul, in 1 Corinthians 7 says, that if you have an unbelieving partner, if one of the partners is a believer, the other one is not, and that unbelieving partner leaves, then you're free to remarry. That's interesting. You don't have to chase your unbelieving mate around the Roman Empire to keep that marriage together. I get it. That's almost certainly what Jesus says in Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. So two reasons. But frivolous reasons, like, well, she burns the toast, so I'm out of here. Frivolous reasons... Ridiculous. No, no. So Jesus is tougher on marriage, if you like, than Moses was allowed to be for the hardness of their hearts. And guess what? Out there on the internet there are people saying, well, we're still just as hard-hearted as Moses. Wait a minute. That's not what Jesus meant. People will find every crooked reason to get round the plain text of Scripture. Everybody knows, or should, that that's not what Jesus meant. He didn't mean, well, you're just as hard-hearted as Moses, so you can have the same exceptions as Moses. No, he said the opposite. People will argue with Jesus, black and white. That's amazing. Even people who claim to be seasoned Bible students. So we really need to listen to the, what I would call the really solid, sound commentaries, which are not always good believers, but they at least can understand plain words and work with that. Okay, um, what else? So yeah, about the entertainment industry? Mm-hmm. Randy says, take away sex, violence, grief, revenge, and the current <laughs> entertainment industry yeah. falls apart. But then again, Randy, uh, they, they claim the Bible teach, uh, teaches all that. So. Well, the I know. The Testament, I mean, it's all about yeah. sex, violence, grief. No, it is. It's, that's also false, obviously. So. Yeah, no, the thank you. The stories the Old Testament. Well, there are stories. We Bible know there are sinners. We know that David made mistakes. Stories are not supposed to emulate the stories. No, no, I'm, I'm yes. saying about the the uh, level of all that mm. that is found in the Old Testament. I know one's saying that you should emulate that. Yeah. About Jesus, uh, just to go back on the uh, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, authorship yeah. issue. Uh, Milk No Sugar says to Lynn, mm -hmm. who's been asking this question. Yes. By what means did Jesus convey the further things he had to say to his disciples, yeah. if not in uh, New Testament books? Yeah. So Absolutely. Good. You've heard, but I'm telling you, Second Second uh, Corinthians three, the glory in the face of Moses of that incredible event when the Ten Commandments were given has been superseded. Yes, the Ten Commandments are now passé in the letter. In the letter, they are. They've been superseded by the new covenant. Not to understand that is to remain with outside or remain outside the new covenant. Very dangerous. Because what you're saying in effect is that Jesus really doesn't count. If in, in fact you insist on Sabbath keeping, 
You're saying that Jesus being my Sabbath doesn't count. I need to keep that weekly right now. You don't. You're <coughs> implying that the Sabbath you find in Jesus, the holy days you find in Jesus, the new moon you find in Jesus, you're saying that's insufficient. Don't go there because that's to be in the wrong covenant and to risk disobeying Jesus, all of which then flies in the face of Hebrews 5, 9, which says that salvation, very key word, is given to those who obey Jesus. Is that hard? No, no. It doesn't say it. those who just obey Moses. Those who obey Jesus. Hebrews 5, 9, teach that to the children, and that's an easy verse. And then, of course, the voice from heaven said of Jesus, this is my son, listen to him. How difficult is that? John 3.36, another one, very good verses. John 3.36, Hebrews 5.9, and the one about the voice where, where this is my son, listen to him. Then John 3.36, he who obeys me, Jesus says, is doing well. He who doesn't believe in me, the opposite of obeying is unbelief. He who doesn't believe in me, the wrath of God is hanging over him. You know, if you're God, you have a right to say that to your creation. The human being ought to listen to the words of God and repent of his errors and get in line with the words of God. Not that any of us, of course, obeys God perfectly. We all sin, that's said in the New Testament too. We all make mistakes, but we better be sure we're not entrenched in some major systematic mistake as, for example, denying the authorship and the inspired authorship of some of the books of the canon of the New Testament. That's a serious mistake, which I think needs to be corrected. The, uh, yeah. Just to go back to Hosea, mm. Hosea. The, the, uh, the, the king here, the mention yeah. of this, uh, I have royal advisors yes. on the day of the king, mm -hmm. you know, that's all the, to do with the, the kings and leaders of Israel. Sure, absolutely. It's amazing in what light they're portrayed. I know. They, they have evil schemes. Yes. Uh, and, this, and then this funny thing I found about the bakers. Yes. They, they, uh, so, this, yeah, these are the leaders of the people of God. Of course. That, that is quite a, That's uh, verse 4. They are all adulterers. God indicted all of those leaders. They were indulging in a lifestyle that qualified as adultery. And yes, the uh, parallels, you know, the Bible is a very realistic book. I, I'm not an expert at all in baking bread. I fully understand that. But quite clearly, there's a parallel between their overheated hearts and the baking of bread. I and mean, you can imagine how that would work. And you can look it all up in the commentaries if you want more detail. But uh, what struck me as interesting is it's kings and princes, verse 5, right? Yeah, kings and saying. princes, right? Rulers. And that's not different in the New Testament. So with that in mind, I will just read to you Revelation 5, verse 10. And just the point about that verse, Anthony, yes. some translations have, or paraphrases mm -hmm. have, they make agreements yes. with evildoers. Good. They, they mm -hmm. make Packs with, with people. Good, in that's a good point. Five, yeah. Some paraphrase translations have uh, the new uh, version. You're talking about seven, five? Yeah, it says, uh, at the celebration of their king, his princes become inflamed with mm -hmm. wine. Mm -hmm. They conspire or mm -hmm. make agreements with evildoers. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, it's not quite what the NSV has. In fact, verse 5 has, he stretched out his hand with scoffers. Scoffers. And that's a significant word. Let seem in Hebrew is critics. And it reminds me of those scholars, so-called, who criticize the Bible. They don't treat the Bible as a tract on immortality. They treat it as some literary piece to be analyzed. They're scoffers. That occurs in Psalm number one. Those people who are doing well are blessed are the ones who meditate in the Torah. They're not like the late seen, the scoffers, the critics. And dare I say it, people who get rid of the book of Hebrews are categorized as critics. They shouldn't be criticized in the book of Hebrews. They should be obeying it. So be very careful you don't become an unbeliever by being a critic in the wrong sense. So it's not evil to us? It's scoffers. A lot of translations are Yeah, scoffers. 
Yeah, that would, there's the scoffers in verse 5. I guess. Right, Ryrie says, Hosea describes a particularly despicable time of revelry, yeah. perhaps a coronation or a royal birthday, such yeah. as the day of our king. Mm -hmm. The lusts of the leaders burn like an ark. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Doesn't comment on the word scoffers there in verse 5? No. So I suppose this is one of the texts that people would use to say we shouldn't celebrate birthdays <laughs> if, <laughs> if this was a birthday. Mm -hmm. <laughs> celebrate your wedding anniversary and your birthday and rejoice the fact that you did have a birthday. Why not? Uh, the ERV yes, has uh, people who laugh at God. They make agreements right. with people who laugh. That's, that's part of being a critic of the Bible. Once again, then the Bible is a tract, a vastly big tract on how to live forever. That takes me on to another topic, which is that the newspapers, the AJC this week, full of stuff on aging in Atlanta and how so-and-so is 94 years old and going to the gym. All of that's good stuff. That person is eating very carefully, exercising, is not heavyweight, and guess what? They're living a long time and they have their own personal trainers on them. And I'm sitting here reading that and saying, yes, but there's one question I have. They're not talking about immortality. Fox News is not, nor is CNN. What? They're talking about living a long life now. It's nice to live a long life. Why not? Why kill yourself? Why break your knees by being heavy? I mean, I'm getting near the knuckle here. Why then have to have an operation to, to repair your knees, which you could have prevented? Why fill your, your heart with, uh, or your stomach with fast food, which everybody knows is not a good idea? Well, stop it then. You might live a few more years. That sounds like a great idea. However, where's immortality? I say that the people who write on the Bible and don't talk about immortality are scoffers. They're, they're mocking the Bible. They're not doing it right. That word scoffers is right there in Psalm 1. 1. It says this, How blessed is the man or woman who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of the scoffers, the mockers, the people who who challenged the Bible, criticize it, tear it apart, analyze it, so like some just a, a literary document, you know, well isn't it saying who wrote Mark? Who wrote Second Peter? Who cares? What does Second Peter say to us? That's the real point. So those are the mockers, the late seam is the Hebrew word it happens to be. Good, let's go on a little bit further then, unless there are other comments, or are we still discussing the earlier one maybe? Yeah, I passed the way in We'll get, please, uh, yeah. try and get back to the Okay, place. and this, all questions are fair, so we thank you, Lynn, for raising that issue. And uh, all of those things are, are fair, fair game. All their kings have fallen, verse 7 of 7 Hosea. None of them calls on me. Isn't that awful? I mean, that's a very bleak scene. They're not calling on God, they should be. All right, verse 8 says this. Um, Yes. Actually, I got a question. Mm -hmm. So, what do we do when our leaders? Mm. So, you know how it all, always there's this thing about the uh, it trickles down. Mm -hmm. So, if you got a, uh, a hierarchy mm -hmm. that is this bad, so what? Some advice for people. What what should we do? How, how do we? You know, people who are under that that kind of leadership, like. And I can transpose this to uh, what's been happening for the last almost 2,000 years with, with the mm -hmm. leaders of the churches yeah. and the whole system yeah. that's been created that some of us believe is not biblical. Right. So what does one do? Any advice for... Well, yes. How, how do you Come out and this? be separate from her. You are not part of this world, Jesus said. You are not part of this system, whether it be ecclesiastical system <coughs> or, or civil system. The state bears the sword. That's what Paul clearly said. Vengeance is mine. I'll do the repaying. You don't do it. So it's a different system. You say, I don't believe in that system. Of course, one has to work then at not being subtly affected. If you, if you absolutely insist on, on listening to one news channel and not another, be careful. You might be being formed by the philosophy of that one or the other. They're both wrong. See, the reason I ask <laughs> is because... Yes. What 
the nature of all of us yeah. is to be led. Of course, yeah. And, and we yeah. need leader and we need rules, yeah. we need guidance. Absolutely. So when that starts to get this yeah. bad, like yeah. this scene here, well, then we are part of the world. We're not to be part of the world. Satan is the god of this age, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. He's the god. That's a powerful word. Satan is the god of this present evil. That's a lot of power. It, it's, it, there's Love a saying, how do, you, mm. how do you see through the woods or something? How, how, how do you tell through a thick brush? Like, it's so thick yes. with evil. Well, the, the thing yeah. that, and your leaders are telling you. You read your it's Bible and you pray. For Pray, and a good point. We're also supposed to pray for the leaders that they would allow us to proceed. I mean, obviously pray for them too, but Paul's actual point there in praying for these is that we would have freedom. We would have freedom to operate in the gospel, which is our task. So I think it's a question of learning. We're trying to do this on Sunday. We're trying to do it in our prayer life and in our Bible reading. Oh, I don't want to be like the world. Don't, don't let me be like the world. If there are things that have encroached into my thinking, which are the world, please show me. Send some kind person to tap me on the shoulder. Wait a minute. Why are you so enamored with this or that political party? Why? <coughs> All of that is not Christian. Jesus is not the government. So something like that. And, and to add to that, mm -hmm. um, at this year's conference, yeah. without naming names, with, you know, I had an experience where so when people do come out, Anthony, mm -hmm. and from this type of evil mm -hmm. thing going on at the top, yeah. and, and you think what they're telling you was true, but then you do wake up and you find the courage to yeah. get out and, and, sure. and be independent right. of that. But then how do we advise people not to go too conspiratorial, <laughs> too, I don't trust anything <laughs> or anyone now, and I'm going to start questioning everything, yeah. even as Lynn, unfortunately, seems yeah. to have been... <clears throat> yeah. uh, so how are we well I mean it's a matter of common sense and advice listening to others if you believe something that from the Bible as I've said to the students you believe something that no commentary in any language for 2,000 years ever imagined yeah but the you whole should thing is rotten right is what? Uh, I'm playing devil's advocate yes. the whole thing is rotten right. right. you tell me to trust evangelical scholars or catholic scholars mm. or this scholar uh, I'm playing devil's advocate here well, so I, I become a person who's totally uh, yeah. what's that word uh, skeptical skeptical mm. and, and nervy no, you still have scripture to deal with. You do your best then to get at the Jewishness of Jesus. He was a Jew, claimed to be the Messiah, and then you have to reject the false traditions like Jesus was man but not a man. I did some of that earlier. You reject the idea that he's God because that would make two gods, and so you're getting closer to the truth, and then you do the best you can. That's all you can do. So, uh, it's a matter of daily meditation, I think. Here's a good paraphrase yep. of the Psalm 1 1. Yes, what does the it say? one who does not follow the advice of mm -hmm. the wicked good. or turn onto sinner's road, yes, sinner's road or stay at scoffer's house is blessed. All right, scoffer's house. Criti I'm, I'm, I'm going critics house. Critics in the wrong sense, scoffer's house is doing well. So these are important things. I think one asks, I, I know we in our theological careers have said, oh God. Send somebody to help me. You know, if we're wrong, Greg Dybul has the famous Dybul prayer. Oh God, if I'm deceived, send somebody to undeceive me. That's a, re a reasonable prayer. And of course, as you said, there are conspiracy theories. There are people who, in their zeal to get the Bible right, say the earth is definitely flat. Oh yes, you meet them. There are people in their zeal to get things right who say that the 9-11 towers fell because the government arranged it and did a photoshop and there's another one too that's the flat earth and the, the towers and there's the idea that there were no Nazis really six million Nazis they didn't really happen and other things so yes you can become wacko and weird so somewhere there's a balance in the community isn't there without being gullible so I think that's a funny one about the earth supposing the Bible actually doesn't tell you what shape the earth is how about that Genesis 1 actually doesn't tell you about when the galaxies were started. It tells you about seven days of creation. And then you look up in the sky, and it should, it should really be in the beginning, was God created the sky and the earth. And guess what? Moses says, 
that in the sky, the birds are flying. Well, that word for sky is the dome across. You know, the sky is kind of a dome, isn't it? The birds are flying in that dome. No, no, no. It's not supposed to be, I think, a totally scientific account. That's fine. We can work that out on some other basis. The key point here would be, this would be of interest to people, in 2 Peter 3, Peter says that at the flood there was a new world order, not a new universe. There was a world order in Genesis 1. The world as made as a home for man. I get it. You look in the sky, there are the birds in, in the dome. I, see, I get it. Sun and the moon are in the dome. They're not strictly quite there, but this is near enough. In seven days God made all that. And 2 Peter 3 says that at the flood, that world order of Genesis was destroyed. Well, the galaxies were not destroyed by the flood. Come on. It took us a while to get this right. No, no, the flood destroyed the earth as we know it. But it didn't destroy the galaxies. So what if it's not talking about the galaxies at all? That's another issue. You can, you can work on science or whatever. But there's no need to argue things from the Bible that the Bible doesn't claim to reveal necessarily. So one has to be careful with that. Okay, we're back then in Hosea. The uh, introduction yes. to chapter 7 in my yes. version mm -hmm. uh, says that these people are blinded by sin and devoured by wickedness. Yes. And of course this applies hugely to us. Yes. Um, but we have a responsibility not to be blinded. Absolutely. Think, probably in, any, in all kinds of fields, not just the only. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Trying to get the truth right. as far as we can. Yeah, the, the current AJC is fascinating. There is a lady there writing on how she killed her, practically killed her 90-year-old mother with the drugs the doctor was giving. Or oh, she was inventing them, but it was a disaster. She was giving her 90-year-old mother some sort of m medical drug. And it practically destroyed this woman. So everything you're getting from the authorities needs at least to be questioned. It's really fascinating material. It's about aging in Atlanta. And you can be threatened with death from very respectable sources. You can be taking a drug that's actually causing something else. We heard stories of that at the conference. So you've got this disease and you're taking a drug which is causing another one. And I'm saying to those people, this doesn't sound to me quite ideal. Now, I don't exactly know what you do there. Certainly you pray hard, you get people to anoint you probably. But God, do I really need to take this drug for one disease which is actually killing me. So I've got another disease now. See, this is what I'm talking about, good. your skepticism. Yes, now, you've come now I'm a skeptic. I'm asking childlike questions and I'm listening carefully to all of you guys to advise me because I'm not an expert in that field, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to be taking a drug that's actually causing another disease. That doesn't sound real to me, that sounds somehow wrong. Anyway, uh, Barbara's comment is most interesting. I just wanted to take this section of Isaiah 29, where we are, we are diverting deliberately. But in, in Isaiah 29, verse, verse uh, uh, let's see, a little bit other than that. Uh, let's go to 18. Your covenant with death will be cancelled. We've been talking about covenant. Your covenant with death is going to be cancelled. Don't have a covenant with death. That's a bad idea. And your pact with Shell, this is verse 18 of Isaiah 28. I've got the wrong chapter. 28. The 28th chapter in 18. Your covenant with death will be cancelled. It's all going to be good in the end. And your pact with Shell, this gravedom, where all the dead are, all the graveyards seen as a great, huge place for the dead, your pact with Shell will not stand. When the overwhelming scourge passes through, then you become its trampling print, a place. So there's going to be punishment. As often as it passes through, it will seize you. It's a bad scene here. But then in 20, it's still a bad scene. The bed is too short on which to stretch out. The blanket too small to wrap yourself in. God is going to rise as at Mount Perizim. He will be stirred up. God is going to take action, go into action as in the valley of Gibeon, to do his task, his unusual task. I think that lies in the future. God is going to do a very unusual thing. Right now he's not just intervening everywhere, obviously punishing people, but he's going to go into action, rise up, to do his task in verse uh, 21. 
Now, 22, I wanted to get to this. Now, do not carry on as scoffers. There we have that, scoffers, critics. Do not continue as critics, or your fetters will be made stronger. I should going to be more and more uh, imprisoned. For I have heard from the Lord God of us of a decisive destruction that's coming on all the earth. 23. Give ear, hear my voice. Isn't that, this is my son, listen to him. Listen and hear my words. That's exactly, this is my son, listen to him. Listen to him. And then he goes on with some interesting points uh, in the chapter 29. I'm moving forward now to chapter 29, verse 9. What has happened then to cause this situation? Here it is, chapter 29 of Isaiah, verse 9. He delayed, uh, be delayed and wait. Blind yourselves and be blind. Now, I'll show you what it's like to be blind. You ain't seen nothing yet. That's my Georgian. Be blind. They become drunk, but not with wine. There we are, right? You can be drunk on nonsense. They stagger, but not with strong drink. They're staggering around. They're all in a big fog. <clears throat> not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. Interesting, huh? Spiritual slumber. He has shut your eyes, the prophets. You prophets, God has closed your eyes. He's covered your head, the seers. He's put a blanket over your head. And he did that for a good reason. The entire vision, look at verse 11. This is amazing stuff. The entire vision of the Bible, of Scripture, will be to you like the words of a sealed book, which when they give it to the one who is learned, is literate, saying, please read this. He says, I cannot. It's sealed. I don't understand it. It's sealed. Then the Lord said, because, now Jesus quoted this verse. Jesus was very impressed with verse 13. The Lord said, because this people draws near with their words and they honor me with their lip service, and they remove their heart far from me and their reverence for me, their religion, that is, consists of tradition learned by rote. Repeated week by week, mindlessly, right? without even realizing what it says to say. I found that very powerful. Jesus loved that verse. So beware then of theology learned by rote, learned by heart, repeated week after week that Jesus is man but not a man, that he's the begotten son, begotten not made. What, what does it mean? No idea. Then correct that because otherwise we're in bad trouble. All of that is simply to say that if you decide to believe falsehood, God will give you over to a spirit of stupor. So you wind up believing what's false. That's second, as you can read this later, second Thessalonians 2. Talking of the Antichrist, Paul says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because a passion for truth they would not receive in order to be saved. I get it. Not a passion for truth so I can be a better Christian. No, a passion for truth in order to be saved. Because they didn't have that passion for truth in order to be saved, God gave them over to a spirit of blindness, a spirit of stupor, so that they would wind up believing what is false. You don't believe what's false. We've been saying, and our good friend there in France keeps reminding us of no sugar, no milk, no sugar, no cyanide, right? You don't want to believe what's false. That's why we're trying to correct everything that's wrong. Because if we persist in believing what's false, God will say, all right, I'll show you what it's like to be blind. Now you really are blind. Now I'll put a sack over your head and you'll be blind. It's a tough system, isn't it? It would be like rote versus reason. Good. Rote versus reason. You learned it by rote. You recite this creed, particularly in the Roman Catholic system, they like to, to even have the service in Latin, so we don't know what it says. Sounds mystical. We don't, want to, we don't care what it says. We want it in Latin. We don't understand it, but it sounds good. Dangerous. Mystical nonsense. No. Not a good idea. Let me add our Luke 21. Yes, please. Uh, what's that saying? Look at the fig tree or mm -hmm. any other kind of tree. Yes. When you see new leaves appear, you don't need to be told that summer is near. Right. In the same way, when you see these things happening, understand that the kingdom of God is about to come. Yes. I tell you the truth. This present evil society will not come to an end. Mm -hmm. Before all these things happen, heaven and earth will come to an end, but mm -hmm. my gospel words will not. Good. Watch out that you don't become distracted. Yes. This is the pregnant part. Yes. By partying or getting drunk, mm -hmm. or by the worries of this life. Yes. So this future day takes you by surprise. Yes. Like a trap. 
for that day will come upon everyone who lives on the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. Always keep watch, keep praying, mm -hmm. so that you may be able to escape all that is going to happen and yes. stand before the Son of Man. Isn't that, isn't that solid common sense? I mean, really, you don't need a whole lot of DDs to explain that. And Paul, by the way, reiterates this in Thessalonians yes. when he says, don't be caught like a thief right. in the night. Right. Be awake at That's all right. times. And like Sarah said, pray for our leaders. Pray for, pray for ourselves that we're not uh, led into a stupor. Right. Is the word of because this. thieves break in and steal. My good neighbor reported to me that while he was away on a three-week visit, mm -hmm. guess what happened? Somebody bashed a window, stole all of his computers, oh. including the family pictures. That was really distressing. Oh. Mm -hmm. And the alarm went off and the police did not get there on time. Gone. Oh. So it can happen even in this relatively peaceful land we live in. So I would pray for safety all the time. And we should pray for those who are very, very sick. We had one gentleman, uh, I won't name him expressly, but we prayed for him expressly, who has a very serious form of cancer. He's taken all the chemotherapy and it hasn't worked. He's now trying alternatives. We're praying for this gentleman, marvelous person, who has uh, a cancer around his carotid artery, very threatening. He's supposed to have been dead two years ago, but he's still living full of faith. So remember this gentleman that God would spare his life and give him extra years now to be with his wife and family. Okay, we're back in Hosea, covering deliberately, I may say, a number of subjects, a number of topics. A verse leads to another verse, comparing text with text, and we've covered a lot of different issues today. Verse eight. Eight. All right, who's got eight for us? You. Okay, Ephraim, this is Samaria, the northern kingdom. Ephraim mixes himself with the nations. <coughs> Ephraim has become a cake, not turned. Strangers devour his strength, yet he does not know it. Gray hairs are also are sprinkled on him, yet he does not know it. Hey. Take objection to Brigham. Ephraim's pride speaks against him. The people had many troubles, but they still didn't go back to the Lord, mm -hmm. their God. They didn't look to him for help. So Ephraim has become like a silly dove without sense. <laughs> they call to Egypt, they go to Assyria. Mm -hmm. Twelve. How terrible it will be for my people who have deserted me. Let them die, for they have rebelled against me. I wanted to redeem them, but they have only spoken lies about me. My goodness. Thirteen. Woe to them. That was thirteen, for they have strayed from me. This is the New American Standard Version. Destruction is theirs, for they have rebelled against me. I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. Fourteen. And they do not cry to me from their heart when they wail on their beds. For the sake of grain and new wine, they assemble themselves. Mm -hmm. They turn away from me. I train them and make their own strong, but they make evil plans against me. Mm -hmm. They turn, but not upward. They are like a deceitful home. Mm -hmm. Their princes will fall by the sword because of the insolence of their tongue. This will be their derision in the land of Egypt. Okay, that's very clear. You know, the Bible is so often full of clear, clear teaching. It really only has one message. That is that we are prone to be evil and wrong. We're supposed to turn and return to God, and then it's going to be wonderful. And this is a classic example of that. Ephraim. Ephraim is the, uh, the code word for the northern kingdom, the ten kings ten kingdoms in the north, as to sing from the three or two, two and a half maybe, in the south, that's Judah. So Ephraim is the northern kingdom that went into captivity massively under the Assyrians in 722 BC. They did, it was an awful deportation as of all the bad stuff they were doing. And they mixed themselves with the nations, that's our earlier question. We are not to be part of this world, not to mix ourselves with politics, Essentially, obviously, we have to observe what the government does and all that's interesting, but we're not part of that political system. So, to say strongly, you know, I'm this party or I'm, I support so and so, we can have our opinions certainly on the way things are done, but we're not essentially part of that system. Ephraim has become a cake not turned, and my cooking friends here can advise me on the parallel. 
I'm not so good at some of these parallels. I, I don't know. I haven't turned the cake. What does that mean? It's half big. Half big. We use it. Thank you. It's like lukewarm. It's weak. Yeah. Weak. Yeah. It's like what Jesus said. It's not thoroughly baked. It's not. No. It's, it's a pretty bad thing. Yeah. It's yeah. half baked. We yeah. use that, right? Yeah. It comes right out of this, it's out of the same image. Can, can we apply this to that saying by Jesus where it says, uh, yeah. I'll speak you out because you're neither cold nor Oh, of course, mind. exactly. But that's a reference to your, uh, you're not making up your mind? No, it's just your weak. It's the lukewarm church, the Laodicean word, the church. Both, yeah. I mean, that's a terrible indictment. Jesus speaks of one of the churches in Revelation. Because you're lukewarm, you're neither this nor that, you're half-baked, I will vomit you out of my mouth. That's a nice thing for Jesus to say. I don't hear many sermons on that, and understandably. But I think my point again is that God and Jesus, who represent God, if you're the creator, you have a right to call the shots, don't you? If you really think somebody is a disastrous, lukewarm person, you have a right to say, watch out, I'll vomit you. I mean, you can say that if you're God. And presumably it gets a reaction, you know, no, not me. So that's powerful language. So mixed with the nations, do not then get mixed up with the nations of this world. Strangers are devouring his strength. See, your, your, your strength is being eaten away at, I get it. Strangers, foreigners, are eating away at your strength. Yet you don't know it. My version is yeah. very clear here. Worshipping foreign gods has sapped their strength. I love that. Well, I wonder what it's doing today. Absolutely. Mm. Worshipping the wrong God, that's exactly the right point, is sapping your strength. So what we do by way of teaching doctrines, which is teachings, is to try to help people not to have their strength sapped. These are not boring doctrines to be argued. They're life, you see. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you are spirit and life. You want energy and health and truth. This is affecting your whole person. Okay, look at this. Gray hairs are showing up. <laughs> he doesn't know it. <laughs> not looking in the mirror carefully to <laughs> pull out the gray hairs or not even noticing. That's, a, that's a, an image that makes good sense to all of us. Though the pride of Israel, ah, there's the problem. The pride of Israel testifies against him, yet they have not returned. What's the other word for return? Repented. Right? Mark 1, 14, 15, Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying, return, repent. Without believing in the kingdom of God gospel, they cannot return. That's what Mark 4, 11 says. You have to believe in the gospel of the kingdom in order to repent and believe in the gospel of the kingdom. If you don't know what the gospel of the kingdom is, you can't repent and you can't be forgiven. So it all begins with believing what God says. Nor they sought him, they haven't sought God for all this. So Ephraim, that's Samaria, the northern kingdom, has become like a silly dove. In the commentary this morning I read that doves apparently are rather witless. They don't have much wit, they're stupid. I, I was rather disappointed in that because I love the sound of a dove, a cooing dove, and it's the symbol of the Holy Spirit in other parts of the Bible, the dove that rested on Jesus and so on. But in this particular context, it's a witless stupid animal. Like the bird that has been beating on our window for day after day after day. Apparently it sees a reflection of the forest in the window and it thinks its territory is being challenged. So it's going beating its head against the window for a little night. Day after day after day. Okay. Anthony, just on your comment about return. Yeah, return, repent. Um, come back. Come back. Course. Come back you to know, the this is a very prominent theme across oh, yeah. uh, the whole of the Bible, right? Absolutely, yes, very much so. Um, and it's simply because the, the problem of God's people yeah. is uh, idolatry. Yes, right? often, yes. Uh, rebellion. Yes. yes. Uh, this situation of... Uh, mm -hmm. Even when you come to faith, then you get involved with arguing with, as you said, with... Yeah. endless genealogies and things for both. Yes. But the thing about return, come back, equals repent, mm -hmm. is very good. And I want to share jo Joel 2.12. Yes. This is the easy to read version. I like paraphrasing. Yes. This is the Lord's message. Now come back to me with all your heart. Cry and mourn. Mm -hmm. Don't need anything. Show, show that you are sad 
We're doing wrong. That's very good. Joe to the nice ERV English. Have we, have we shown that? <laughs> no, don't, yeah. Never mind between us. If I done you wrong, yeah. then you're wrong. Uh, but God, have we done that with God? Sure. Have I expressed right. uh, this sort of oh, yeah. return to God? Wow, that's, that's the key. That's a nice it's parallel. exactly parallel, and it's the major theme of Scripture in all the prophets. Show that you are really sad about doing wrong. Look. Yeah. Ephraim has become like a silly dove, without sense, there it is, without sense, without heart. Actually, Hebrew has heart. The heart, you see, is the seed of the mind in the Bible. It's not the seed of your emotions. And the kidneys? The, the kidneys, kidneys also involved with emotions more. But heart is, is to do with your mind. So like a silly dove, which has no heart and no mind. Mindless, that's what it is, mindless. Uh, actually, before we get to uh, mm -hmm. minor comments here. Okay. I uh, just want to thank uh, Lynn yes. for moving on to yes. comment. Um, the baked thing, the half, half baked mm -hmm. milk or sugar, mm -hmm. the church's half baked theological ideas are born of compromise with paganism. Yes. yes. <laughs> that's exactly right. And that's Keegan's book. It's, it's a, a, a very solid read, but his thesis is not his own. He didn't invent this, but. It's perfectly obvious to famous historians like Harnack, the German historian, and Lufs and others we've quoted, that the church became involved with pagan philosophy. They were Neoplatonists, some of them, before they became Christians, and they liked this Neoplatonic thing, and gradually, not overnight, but gradually, 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 they rewrote the creeds in terms of Neoplatonism, giving this Jesus was man, but not a man. That's a disaster. We can go back. We have so much information now. We can read the Bible in its original Hebraic. Corey uh, shares uh, mm -hmm. about all this theme of rebellion and delusion. Mm -hmm. uh, Second Thessalonians yeah. 2, Good. 11. Good. Using every time of evil trick, the Antichrist yes. deludes those who are on their way to destruction yes. because they will have refused. Mm -hmm. So it's their choice. Yes. yes. To develop the passion for the truth. I love it. To ensure their persuasive. Uh, sorry, to ensure their salvation. Yes. Because of this, so because we choose yes. to do this, yes. God is going to let loose among them a persuasive delusion oh, yes. so that they put their faith in the lie. As a result, everyone who decided not to believe the truth, yes. is a paraphrase. Yeah. But delighted in wickedness and wrongdoing <clears throat> will be condemned. That's you reading from my paraphrase, that whole thing? Yeah. Yeah, I, I like what I did there. Sometimes we need to correct. But that part of the translation, I think, gets it over well. God gave them over to a spirit of delusion to wind up believing what's false. Okay, so 12 then, here's the punishment part. I will bring them down. Like the birds of the sky, it's an image from shooting birds, I suppose, or uh, firing arrows at birds. I will chastise them in accordance with the proclamation to their assembly. The, uh, okay, the report, the proclamation to their assembly. 13. Woe to them. That's a very powerful word. Woe is the strongest thing you can say. Jesus said to the Pharisees, Woe to you, Pharisees, right? It's not looking good. That's an understatement. Woe to them, for they've strayed from me. Destruction is theirs, God's response now, for they've rebelled against me. I would redeem them, 13, but they speak lies against me. That's a bad idea. They do not cry to me from their hearts when they wail on their beds. They're crying out, wailing, but they're not begging to be forgiven for the sake of grain and new wine, they assemble themselves. They turn away from me. That's the opposite of repentance. Although I trained and strengthened their arm. That's interesting. God has been helping the nation, training them, strengthening them. Yet they devise evil against me. They turn, but not upwards. They're turning, but in the wrong direction. They're like a deceitful bow, there's another image on All these images are, are, are very simple, aren't they? They're all born of that society. I don't understand bows and arrows at all, but these people did. 
they're like a deceitful bow. Their princes, their courtiers, their leaders, their executives will fall by the sword. Because of the insolence of their tongue, this will be their derision in the land of Egypt. Okay, just point this out, then verse 11. The two enemies that they call on, Egypt in the south and Assyria in the north. So we finish with this point. The Assyrian, apparently, is the evil enemy that Israel calls on in the future. Because Paul, in 2 Thessalonians 2, is referring to the Antichrist. And he says that that Antichrist is going to be killed by the spirit of the sword of the mouth of Jesus at his second coming. And he's there quoting from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 4, where it's the Assyrian, the king of the north, almost certainly Daniel 11. Assyria is a geographical term in the Bible which could include Iran, Iraq, and even Persia, because in Ezra 6.22, Persia is called the Assyrian. So it's a geographical area, it's Middle East, you see. A lot of prophecy studies went wrong, I think, when they thought Europe was the bad guy. Now, Europe could be involved in all that, I don't know. But the essential enemy is either Egypt in the south or Assyria in the north, the king of the north in Daniel 11, the Assyrian Antichrist of Isaiah 11.4, so when we have this compact, apparently for seven years, a false compact, they will make a compact, a contract, a covenant for one final period of seven years with the Antichrist. In other words, Jewish people in the Middle East will say, peace and safety is going to come now if we can just ally ourselves with this or that country. That's going to be a bad idea. It will look good for three and a half years. But in the middle of that final heptad, that final period of seven years, that evil guy will turn out to be a beast, you see. He starts by being smooth, then he turns into a beast, and then he attacks Israel. So the last scene in the Bible is always a vicious attack on Israel. Zechariah 12, verse 3, for example, especially in the Septuagint version, they're very powerful. It says that Israel is going to be attacked by nations who are trampling on it, treading on it, until, 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 finally they get the point and say, oh, this is awful, what have we done wrong? And they return, they repent, and Jesus comes. And a remnant of them, at least, gets the point. They become then a model nation in the kingdom. Meanwhile, you who are now Christians are in training to be the model immortals in the kingdom. You're going to have life forever. This is the missing element on Fox News and CNN. I don't hear them talking about that. Why not? Why are they not discussing not how to live till you're 95, which is nice, how to have a good diet so you can live and remain slim until you're 102. That's fine. But how about living forever? Your job, being the ones who know about living forever, immortality, your job is to infiltrate into the system, drop hints here and there, and see, as, uh, for instance, one of the ladies at the gardening meeting, where we had a, a nice meeting about birdsong, and I started talking to her about the kingdom. And she said, that's interesting. So I gave her a book, and then she got back on the phone and said, I've been reading that book, it's kind of interesting. You bet it's interesting. Come on, lady, it's the only thing that counts is there's going to be a kingdom. Where are you going to be in that kingdom? We all want a solution to the world's problems. Jesus said, your kingdom come. I get it. That's easy. It's a real material kingdom on this renewed earth, and you are going to be the executives, the courtiers, the royal family, the princes ruling with the king. Is that hard? No, your children of three can understand that. So explain it to them. That would be the lesson. Okay, I think we're out of time, are we not? We've uh, covered yeah, a lot of that. Comments? Yeah. Um, yeah, so let's not, uh, as uh, mm -hmm. I'm <clears throat> not sugar put it, yes. let's not fall or uh, have faith theological right. ideas of the church. Fake news. How about that? That's a very good... Use the current political language. Fake news is all over the news, right? Well, Alternative truth. <laughs> Alternative truth. There you go. Thank you, Ricky. We need um, that. That's got one. some comment here yep. from... Uh, <laughs> I try to listen to this live every Sunday when I'm not working and I have truly and I am truly thankful for it because after I left the JWs, mm. 
I didn't think I would find Christians who believe as I do. Thanks yes. for being here. Well, thank you for your encouragement. You, you, you don't know how that is a, a tremendous encouragement for us. Uh, D. Shaw says, this is the finest forum for truth on the internet. <laughs> He's a generous uh, and approving uh, listener there. We, we uh, want to express our thanks to D. Shaw, by the way, for his continued uh, enthusiasm, his excitement, you know, week by week. Without that, I think we'd all fold up and die. So we're really, the audience out there is 70% of what we do, probably. <laughs> 